And as we look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 12, we've been looking at the things that God has given us, the blessings that we have that are, that are, rem that are our reminders that in our times of trouble, in our times of difficulty, in our times of uh, trials, grief, that they can encourage us and keep us uplifted. And in verse 10, Peter writes, he says, concerning this salvation, the salvation that he's been talking about from verse three, right? Well, really from verse one, right on down. He said, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look in to these things. And I think it's just interesting to think about our unique position in light of this salvation. And we have, what we have and what we look forward to means that we are living in the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, verses 10 through 12. Now, it's interesting that the prophets saw, but they couldn't grasp the time or the circumstances that the Spirit pointed them to, you know. And it's interesting, as you read these verses, look at what he says in verse 11. Trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ. So Christ was in the prophets, prophesying about what would happen to him. You catch that in that verse? I mean, that's, it's, it's kind of interesting when you hit it, when you see it and you read it that way, that the Holy Spirit is one who moved the prophets to record the prophecies, the word of God. But it was the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit prophesied in the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit are the same, in other words. And they prophesied about what was going to happen. Christ prophesied about what was going to happen to him in his life. Now, they couldn't grasp the time and circumstances. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 40, in that great chapter on faith, wraps up that chapter by telling us that God had planned something better for us. After giving that whole roll call of the heroes, we call them of faith, and all the great things that, that they accomplished and what God did with them and through them, God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. In the new covenant, we, as, we have a privilege that the Old Testament prophets nor the angels had. Now that's interesting to think about. Do you realize that we have a closer, maybe the word is different, but a closer, different relationship with God than Abraham, than Moses, than the prophets? Have, have we ever really thought about it that way? Or is that something that's new in your thinking? Because that's what he's saying. The Old Testament prophets tried, they tried to find out when and how what the Holy Spirit was prophesying through them was going to take place, but they never could do that. They searched intently and with the greatest care. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. The prophets knew when they were prophesying 
about the coming of the Lord and the things that were going to be happening, that it wasn't going to be for them. It was going to be for us. I think that's just, you know, really humbling, if you will, to think about this. You remember, in light of what I said a moment ago, that we have a different and a closer relationship to God than the Old Testament, Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, Elijah. Remember what Jesus said of John the Baptist? He said, there has been no greater prophet than John. He said, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Now, if that doesn't just make you want to sit down and think about the grace of God that is within us. Our relationship is greater because it is different. We have now the Holy Spirit living within us. They were anointed by the Spirit. They were led oftentimes by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. But we have the Holy Spirit living within us. And Christ in us, the hope of glory that Matt preached on for so long, you know, that is a reality that we have that they did not have. They look forward to it, but they did not have that. I think that is just really an interesting thing. And then he, you know, if that wasn't enough, he backs it up in, uh, at the end of verse 12. Even angels long to look in to these things. Angels cannot understand. Yes. No. So you say that. And that's where, that's where the challenge comes in. You know, and that's what the writer to the Hebrews in, in chapter 12, after giving that list, he said, we have a cloud of witnesses. We should look to them to encourage us to be the type of person that they were in their faith. And it, it is to think about, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the, if you will, the same type of assurance that we have as believers today. But they were willing to be used by God in the various circumstances. Now this was, we have these prophets, that, that wasn't everybody in Israel. So, you know, not everybody had this. But these folks were used by the Holy Spirit, are we allowing the Holy Spirit to use us? I think that is a conviction. That is a challenge to us. Are we open for the Holy Spirit, who we have in greater measure every day, every hour, every moment with us, are we open for him to work in us and through us to do the will of God? like these guys did in their particular circumstances. I mean, it, it's just, it's, it is challenging, it's convicting, and it's, it's humbling to think about that. These Old Testament prophets saw that they were not serving themselves, but, but you, you and me. We, we are in the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. The last days, and yes, I'm glad to see the offering bowl going around. It's, <coughs> It's that time. It's that time of. It's that time of month again. Oh, you got it. Teresa's got it. So I'll, I'll take my. I'll take my. I'll take my two hundred dollars and put it back in here. Uh, yeah. 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 
There we go. Just took off right off into the wild blue yonder. I'm sorry. No, I, I, that was me. I just, I did. I saw the saw the bowl going around, and there I go. You know, I'm not ADHD, but I'm just not too focused every now and then. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but we are living in the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. The last days began with the birth of Jesus Christ. And we're 2,000 years into the last days, 2,024 years into the last days, depending on which kind of calendar you use, da 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 da. But the Old Testament prophets were saying, you're gonna have this. This is what you are going to be able to enjoy. And it's something to think about, especially in times of difficulty, in times of trouble, in times of trial, what these folks were going through. Peter saying, look at what you've got. Remember what's ahead of you. Not only what you have now, but look at what's ahead of you. You know, it's, it's no wonder, as he began this section of, of scripture, We can understand how he began this section with praise. Look at this at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing to people that are hurting. He's writing to people that are suffering, who, who are being ostracized, who are being pressured. Now we today, if the preacher was to stand up and say, we ought to just really just praise God for all, you know, we'd look at him and say, do you know how I, what I'm facing? Do you know what I'm going through? Peter said, this is what we need to offer in light of what we go through. We have been given mercy, new birth, living hope, inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It's kept in heaven for you. We have a protected faith, shielded by God. We have the expectation of the full revealing of salvation. He's coming, and we're going to get a, a glorified body. We have an internal fullness that faces all adversity. That's the Holy Spirit that moves and lives within us. And we are now living in the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. And even angels can't receive what we have. Look at that list. These folks are not the only ones who had that list. All of us in this room have that list. And that puts us above angels? Yeah. Spiritually. Yeah. Yeah, spiritually. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, angels want to look into what we experience because they've never, they've never had to be forgiven. They don't know what failure and grace and mercy and forgiveness is about because they've never needed it. And they look at us, and, and I'm sure, I don't know whether angels scratch their heads because I don't know what angels actually look like in heaven. But they have to wonder, how does this happen? They may be, and I'm, I'm speaking now, this is from First Poindexter 2-1, you know. Angels may well be, you know, looking at us and wondering how. How can this happen? Yeah, yeah. God is holy. They, you know, they in Revelation when we see the present, the angels singing. What are they singing? Holy, holy. They, they see the holiness of God, and ever how they see us down here, they've got to say, how? How does this work? They don't understand the grace of God. They can talk about power, glory, omniscience, omnipresence of God. They can do all those things. But they can't understand salvation. They can't understand forgiveness. 
they can't understand grace and favor from a perfectly holy God to a punishment deserving people. They see Christ. They see the wounds in his hands and his side. And they still, he provided, but why? It's just, it's interesting with that. Questions, comments on this? I mean, you know, I've spent, you know, way longer than I thought I'd spend on these first 12 verses of chapter 1. But they're very important. They were very important to people who were hurting then. They're very important to people like us who hurt sometimes now. I have gone to these past to this passage since going over it since doing the study of 1 Peter some months ago. Just for my personal use, I have gone to these verses several times when I needed to be reminded that look at what you got, Billy. Look at what's coming. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, you almost get the feeling that if when Satan accuses us to God, that they're on the sideline saying, well, you know, he's got a point, you know, uh, even though they know better. This is what you have, I have, no wonder Peter begins with praise. Now, what we have and what we will have is an incentive to holy living and love. This is what Peter talks about from uh, chapter 1, verse 13, through chapter 2, verse 3. This is, this is what he's going to be dealing with. And in light of all that he has told us we have, should not God expect something from us, you know? Peter says in verse 13, therefore, that's looking back on all 12 verses, you've got all of this, therefore, God's mercy and grace is never given without expectation that the proof of that reception is demonstrated in a person's life. right there <laughs> I can say that to her I can't say that to y'all God's mercy and grace is never given without expectation that the proof of that reception is demonstrated in a person's life what do you think about that statement Does God ever save someone without expecting that they should live right? It's basically what that statement is saying. What we have is, is an incentive because there's an expectation that what you've been given, given, people will be able to see it in your life. This is what uh, Peter's going to be dealing with. There are five exhortations in this section that examples obedience to Jesus. Remember back in verse 2. We who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by His blood. All that we have been given is to enable us to be able to obey Jesus Christ in our daily living. So there's five exhortations from uh, verse 13 through chapter 2, uh, verse 3, that we're going to look at here. And how you like me dividing this up instead of showing the whole page? Is that, is that better? 
You, don't, you have no idea how hard I struggled trying to get these things to show like that. Now, I remember when I was training some, some six years, eight, seven years ago now, you know, I was doing all kind of PowerPoint stuff. I could jiggle things around, make it fly in and disappear and all this. I'm sitting there thinking, okay, how do I do this now? How do, you know, I must have spent a couple hours on doing some of the things that you're going to see probably this morning. <coughs> And uh, then I decided, well, I'm just going to quit. <laughs> and I'll try again. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it almost gave me a headache, you know. <laughs> he says in verse 13, prepare. Look at what he says in verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Now, the word prepare is the Greek word for gird up. Gird up your minds. In other words, the whole of our personality or soul. That's what he's talking about when he talks about our minds. The new birth brings with it the demand to develop a new way of thinking about life. This isn't automatic. When we got saved, we were given a new life. Given a new birth into a new life spiritual life that spiritual life now is to guide how we interact with the world and that takes a change in how we think about life and how we approach life what's important in life you know go right down the line with all those things and that's what he's saying prepare gird up your minds change he's talking to these folks change the way you're thinking and bring it in line with Jesus Christ. And we have this exhortation, you know, all through the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 12, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that's so easily entangled. You've heard that preach on, you know, a million times in your life. You know, believers were considered strange. Look at, that's what Jesus said, to God's elect strangers. Verse 1. Believers were considered strange to the lost and were being treated as suspiciously weird individuals. Couldn't trust these people now. Something wrong with them. Why? Because they weren't living like everybody else. And to face such pressure, Peter is saying, you've got to gird up your mind. You've got to bring your mind into focus in this new life. They must realize and behave from a new way of thinking. And one commentator notes that thinking in a new way doesn't come automatically. It requires effort, concentration, and intentionality. That's why to use an illustration that's been used for 100 years, you stump your toe, you hit your thumb with a hammer, how easy is it to react in an old way? <clears throat> huh? Yeah, it, because it's easy for us to do that. And we have to be very intentional that when something like that happens out of the blue, that in staying, saying the favorite cuss word that we used back in the day, we say something else yeah. that isn't offensive. Huh? Massey Ferguson. Massey Ferguson, yeah. Or I, I've got a saying that my daddy told me about, and he said his granddaddy, his granddaddy used it. And he said, I never did understand what it meant, but it's, he, he said his granddaddy would say something happened, he'd say, oh, the cat's foot. And I've thought about that for years. And I guess he meant that, you know, like, if you're sitting in a chair and you got a cat and they wave their tail underneath the rocking chair and you rock on it, cat go, ah, all, you know, oh, the cat's foot or cat's tail. You know, I, I don't know. But that's, you know, I have, I have had some pains recently. And there have been times that it would be a very sharp pain or I would do something stupid like when I was trying to cook this morning and you know, I don't cook clean. Let me just say that. I, I'm a messy cook. Teresa, look at her. Look at her. 
And two of my favorite sayings now is the cat's foot and stupid. <laughs> because generally I've done something stupid that, you know, I was going to take a big swallow of coffee this morning. Took the lid off my little coffee cup, <laughs> spilt it upside my face. Stupid Billy, you know. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that, that letter T gives me a lot of trouble, on, in, especially handwritten, you know, uh, recipes. I, I, I look at them, I look at that T, and I'm automatically thinking tablespoon. And it's a good thing that she said, what are you doing? Because it would have been a lot more, you know. Yeah, what's that? Stupid, Stupid Billy. That, yeah, use it. I mean, you know, it's less offensive to God than some of the other things we could use. So, you know, feel free. You know, I have no copyright on that, so feel free to use it. You know, but prepare, gird up your minds, gird up the way you think. <laughs> and gird up your minds with, look at what it goes on to say, with self control. Be self controlled. Be self controlled. Controlling our thoughts so that neither excess nor reckless irresponsibility guides our thinking and thus our behaviors. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In other words, have sound judgment in all areas of life. This is what he's saying. Folks, you're going to face a world that looks at you as really strange and almost dangerous. So you really need to be in control of yourself. Don't have excessive emotional outburst necessary. We'll use that as one example here. Or reckless irresponsibility. Don't let these things guide your thinking. Have sound judgment. How important is that? How many of you have wished that we would see that in our government today? Sound judgment in all areas. You may not have said it that way, but this is probably what you were inferring. So I wish we had somebody up there that had some sense. I, you know. Huh? Well, I know I've said that about my kids sometimes. And I have one that will be watching this video, so, you know. And I'm sure my kids have said that about me, you know. I wish you had some sound judgment sometimes. But this is how, this is one of the, the you know, in, in thinking about obedience to Christ, the first is to prepare your minds, be self-controlled, and look up. Look at how many, how many times he's encouraging us here. In just these 13 verses. Looking up. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. The revelation of Jesus Christ. We act now with a view to what is coming then. We don't act now just for now. We act for what is coming. This is how we react. This is how we respond. This is how we think, how we plan. Because whatever we are doing in the moment, in our jobs, in our lives, with our families, right on down the line. We have to always realize that there is a revelation coming of Jesus Christ. And we need to think about what is coming in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. You've heard that also, you know, more times than you can count. But look at what he said. Set your minds, verse 2. Well, let me go back to verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. Your old life, your old way of looking at things died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Go down to verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Look ahead. 
This is what we've got ahead of us. Whenever things come that do not suit us, and that happens every day to some degree. Some are just irritations, annoyances. Some may be devastating. Think about what is going to be revealed, what you have promised to you. It's important. And we'll see this time and again in this section of Scripture. And we'll see it in Peter, this, this whole First Peter chapter uh, 1 through 5. We are faced with the dichotomy of the Christian life. We have a new nature that is born of the Spirit that places the character of Christ into our lives. In order to accomplish this, the power of the old life must die. We are dead in Christ, as I talked about in Colossians. However, we have this treasure in jars of clay, earthen vessels, as Paul says in Corinthians. So it doesn't have the full realization of salvation, which is the redemption of our bodies. It takes care of that carnal human nature. And it's that dichotomy, the, the work of salvation begins the process of sanctification or the continued rejection or putting to death the lust and desires and the will of our humanity that forever strives against the Holy Spirit. This is the process, and I've referred to this verse over and over again because it's so wonderful. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, he has perfected forever them that are being made holy. How can you make holy someone is perfect? You have a perfect standing in your relationship with God, but this treasure is in earthen vessels, human natures, and the work of the Holy Spirit is to bring our human nature in line with our spiritual nature in day-by-day -day application of it. Then another example of Christ, he says in verses 14 through 16, look at what he says. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. So, another part of the expectation of demonstration in our lives of the grace of God is that we are holy. And Peter opens this by appealing to our familial relationship. He says, verse 14, as obedient children, obedient children to our Heavenly Father. So just as we as fathers, parents, expect our children to obey how much more and even so our heavenly father expects us his children to obey him in our lives now this isn't old testament legalism he quotes from leviticus be holy because i am holy Levit leviticus chapter 19 i can't recall the verse right off the top of my head 19 i think uh, it may be different, but it's in there, in Leviticus. And it's so easy, and people have taken this, well, you know, God says be holy, so you've got you to quit smoking and drinking and cussing and fussing and, and, and running around and, and, you know, go all the way down the line. And if you're really holy, you stop drinking coffee, you stop drinking tea, you don't drink any type of sodas. And if you're really holy, women, you don't wear pants, you don't wear jewelry, you don't wear makeup. And if you're really holy... You know, you see how that can go right down the line. I grew up in that with those, hearing those words. He's, but he's not talking about this. He's not talking about a bunch of things that you do that you can point to and say, well, I don't do this, so I'm, I'm really good. John Wesley and some of his friends, back before he got saved, isn't that interesting? 
back before he got saved, started a holy club in England. And every week they would meet and compare to see who was the most holy for that week. And thought that they were serving God. But that's not what God is talking about. So, how do we live holy? What constitutes holy for New Testament Christians? Be holy. Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. That's the first element of being holy. As Paul says in Romans 6, don't allow sin to reign in your mortal body by obeying it. What? The body. In the lust thereof. Don't give Satan, there, there's a book, don't give Satan a seat at your table or something like that. We follow our human nature lust desires and we automatically go to sex when we use that word but really you talk about power influence control domination you, there's a lot of other things that people lust after other than just sex but do not allow sin to reign in your mortal bodies by obeying your body in the lust thereof There you go. And then be holy in all you do. Live not conforming to the evil desires in everything you do. Allow the power of grace to be witnessed in how you live, walk, talk, work, play, whatever. We live different. We act different. We play different than the world does. I look, at, I look at advertisements for major league sports. And you almost every time you see it, there's somebody just lost their mind screaming or they got a beer in their hand, they're holding all this up. And emotion in and of itself is not bad. And I have said times in this class, drinking is not bad. The Bible doesn't forbid one to drink. Forbid you to be under the influence of it. But I've often thought how uncomfortable I would be in the middle of all that. For a number of physical reasons, I just don't like the hollering and the screaming. You know, I'm just not that type of demonstrative person. At my age and in my condition, I just can't. I've gone to some of Grant's ball games, and you can ask Teresa, when those cheerleaders start stomping on those, you know, they about to lose my mind. <laughs> you know. So, you know, and some of you may like it to be in the middle of, the, of that roar. And if so, that's okay. That's a roar I don't like. <laughs> Bell ringing, telling me to shut up. <laughs> but in everything, in how you live, may people look at us in the middle of all those things and see that there's something different in the way we're behaving. Not that we're trying to promote ourselves as somebody, but because we have an obligation to live different before our Father who is in heaven. We'll talk some more about this. These, these are interesting things. that You'll see them repeated in various ways throughout the rest of the book. Thank you.